our 80th anniversary commemoration of the fall of Singapore. Neil, I'm going to go ahead and let you introduce our first guest because I know that you you know her and you have a connection to her. Uh, so take it away with our first guest for our 80th anniversary of the fall of Singapore commemoration. Well, yes, we are honored to be joined from the UK at the very late hour in the UK, I have to say, by a wonderful author, Louise Cordingly, who is the daughter of Eric Cordingly, who was the chapel the Changi Chapel Chaplain throughout the Japanese occupation. Louise, it is an honor to have you on our show. Thank you for joining us. It's an honor for me to be on your show, so thank you. No, please. I mean, we'll get into your books into more detail, but for the benefit of our listeners and our viewers, please tell us the extraordinary story of your father. Um, well, and there were many extraordinary men, so I, I only know about my dad, of course, but he arrived in Singapore nine days before the surrender. He said there was a furious battle going on, as we know, Battle of Singapore, which would either end in a massacre or surrender. Then they did surrender. And um, he, first of all, he went out um, with an ambulance to find any bodies. He went up Mount Pleasant Road in, and mm -hmm. Kim Hock Road to yep. find bodies and the ID discs and things, um, and you know, just buried the bodies where he could. Where he could, and then they were all put in Changi. As you knew, they marched up to Changi, and within a couple of days, he discovered an abandoned mosque um, in in the precinct of Changi, and um, he got permission to use it as a church, and he said it was fantastic because Indian troops had been had been using it beforehand. And he said it's fantastic because it was open on three sides and therefore it was cool for the services. And um, little by little, people, um, the other prisoners, um, made nice things to dress this little chapel up. And it became really a really popular place, St George's they called it. Um, and um, it, it was really popular, but my dad is quite a pragmatic man. He said... Well, it wasn't necessarily for the religion they came, but they came because they were homesick, these poor young men. Mm, sure. Dumped in the middle of the, you know, no news from home, no way of getting hold of, you know, their own family or anything like that. And so they liked to come to the services and they got more and more uh, busy and popular. That was before they went up to um, work on the death railway. Can I just mm. clarify one point there, Louise? Yeah. You said that he came out nine days before. So your father I, was fully aware of the dangers he was walking into. The Japanese advance had already begun in Malaysia. They were heading south into Singapore. So astonishing bravery on your father's part in the sense that he knew what he was heading into. I think he's a modest man. I don't think he'd ask, he wouldn't want to be called brave. He and, and you know, the Royal Northumberland fusiliers, they were just sort of dumped there right in the middle of battle and yeah. actually he said that um yeah. as a padre a priest he, he always felt a bit in the way during in the way of the guns and things so mostly he would be helping the medical people but at the moment there was a surrender he then had a proper job to do he said actually he called it the most wonderful time of his life which is extraordinary when you know how awful it was Oh, that's amazing. We're talking with Louise Cordingly, who is an author. She's written three books uh, related to her late father, Eric Cordingly, who was the chaplain at the Changi Chapel during World War II. And Louise, tell us a bit more about your father. What kind of a, what kind of a man was he? Obviously, a man of the cloth. Uh, you mentioned he was a very humble man. But t tell us a little bit more about who he was and, and what he was like. Well... <clears throat> The interesting thing is, of course, when he came home, he, he never talked about it. Mm. So we only really discovered what he'd done during the war when we d discovered some diaries. This was um, many years after he died and after my mum died. We then were looking through papers and discovered he'd actually written, uh, typed up a diary while he was in Changi. Uh, when did he pass away, Louise? Which year? He passed away in 1976 when he was okay. uh, 65. And we think probably he had cancer, probably weakened yeah. by the starvation conditions they'd been under mm -hmm. during the war. Um, yeah. Please continue. So, Sorry to interrupt. But, no, so, so what I'm trying to say is he carried on his life as a... Uh, he, he eventually became a bishop, actually, um, mm. but never talked about this. And so when we finally looked at his, found his diaries, we suddenly realized that he had been quite heroic during the war. And... Um, hopefully had helped a lot of other people for instance when they were up by the river Kwai, he um he actually buried 600 young men 
Um, he, he asked the doctors when he got there, we all know about the conditions there, were absolutely awful. These men were, were used to slave labor and dying of tropical diseases. And um, he asked the medics to let him know if someone was dying. He tried to be with them when they died. Then he took the body out and gave it um, a proper dignified burial. And mm. I, I mean, I think that's a fantastic thing to do, six, 600 young men. Um, and he said that was the hardest thing he ever had to do. Um, and then, as you probably know, when they came home, they couldn't talk about it. You know, they sort of didn't have the language to tell their families how awful it had been, and they tried to bury it, um, which is uh, not very good for them, because I think they, they were all tra traumatised. Yeah. Well, I'm holding up the book now that you mentioned. It's called Down to Bedrock, The Diary and Secret Notes of a Far East Prisoner of a War Chaplain, 1942-45, that you and your family helped to put together. It is available at the Changi Chapel Museum and across Singapore and online called Down to Bedrock. And what strikes me looking at this book, Louise, is this astonishing, you mentioned it there, modesty, humility, and almost pragmatism. He kept this yeah. diary... Yeah. Not knowing if he was going to survive, yeah. not knowing where it was going to end up, not knowing if it had any value. And, of course, it has priceless value, particularly now to, to future generations. It has extraordinary value. He comes across as such a humble, pragmatic man. And I, as I believe he didn't even really talk about these diaries much. Is that true? I, I didn't even know he'd, he'd done it until he died. Um, wow. and it's quite interesting. You're talking about the next generation. That is, it's really important because my children... Um, who are now in their 30s, 40s, they are now very interested in what their grandfathers did. So uh, there is still quite a lot of interest in, in what happened um, out in yeah. Changi and, and on the River Kwai. Yeah. Lorenz, I, I know that you do, you do many things in your life, but when did it first strike you that, that you were going to really be the voice of your father in many ways and, and mm -hmm. carry on this legacy? I mean, this, this alone is a full-time vocation, uh, avocation to, to dig up the, the history and the facts and put it all together in a way that is interesting and relevant to a, a, the current generation. When, when did that first strike you that this is going to be your mission? That, that's, a, that's a nice question. Um, I am a couples counselor, actually, or therapist, so that was what I was doing at the time. And mm. I do have three brothers, two older, born before the war, and one much younger than me. But I have this feeling that um, I was born in 1946, just a year after he got back. I have a sense that, in a way, I was absorbing the information without knowing it, kind mm -hmm. of haunted. Um, I have interviewed other people, other people of my generation, and somehow they knew there were horrors, horrors even though they weren't talked about. So um, it was obviously me who wanted to write, to write the story. Um, and I, I did ask my brother's permission, and we all piled in. One brother did maps. Um, another brother helped to print it for me. So mm. it was a family um, nice. project. And nice. I just wanted to add that in the book of the diaries, you also include original drawings by mm -hmm. fellow prisoners at Changi. Yeah. I think that's so important that you've, you've, yeah. you've included other people's work as well. Absolutely. About 60. Um, he, bought, he, he obviously brought them home with him, um, and we wanted them to be seen. Yeah. Especially and I wanted the Christmas cards. Beautiful oh, yeah, absolutely. cards. Yeah, absolutely. Beautiful. Interesting. And, and this is the point I really want to get to. You have another book, and this is the yeah. one I'm truly passionate about because it's one of Singapore's great, extraordinary stories, The Changi Cross, A Symbol of Hope in the Shadow of Death, also available at all bookstops, uh, bookshops in Singapore. Now, for the benefit of many younger, and maybe not so younger, listeners and viewers listening to our show today who may not know this extraordinary story, please share with us how this came about and how this symbol of bravery, of peace, survived. Yes, it's a nice story. Um, my father brought back this, this cross, brass cross, after the war and put it in his study. And then when he died, my mother didn't know what to do with it, so she put it in the spare room. And then she heard that there was, in, in 1991, I think it was, there was a little chapel put outside Changi Jail. That they put a little replica chapel. And uh, my, one of my brothers was there, and he said, you know, to my mother, I think they'd like... If you've got some things, they'd, they'd like it. So my mother picked up the cross and said, this is the thing we must send back to them. So um, another brother and I were about to go to Australia. So we took it to Singapore. That was in 1992, 30 years ago. And they were thrilled to have it and put it on the um, altar of what was only a replica chapel. Um, and then um, five years later, um, a phone call came. And um, 
it was a man out of the blue. He said, um, I think my father was the man who actually made the cross. Huh. So I, wow. it, this was very interesting because this poor man, uh, Bernard, his father um, died on the boat on the way home to England. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. Bernard was only four when he went to war. Um, mm -hmm. And so he never knew his father. And in fact, his mother died during the war. So he became an orphan. So he said, um, I, I must go and see this cross. He read about it in, in a Far East Prison War magazine, and he got so excited, he, he and his wife went out there. And they took the perspex cover off and gave him the cross to hold it. He said he just broke down and burst into tears. He oh. said, I felt I was, for the first time, actually in touch. I was holding the cross. I was in touch with my father. Um, wow, and that's what, such what, a sweet story. Um, and, and the story. cross was made out of a howitzer, 4.5 howitzer shell, case oh. brass case from the first world war so a cross oh. made out of a, a shell case unreal we're talking with louise that's cordingly it. That's it. yeah yeah with louise mm -hmm. cordingly author of three books the changi cross down to bedrock and also uh, eric the scrunch ball it's about her father uh, and louise's father was the chaplain of the changi chapel uh, in during World War II in the prisons, some 50,000 men that he had uh, had worked with and, and ministered to. Uh, Louise, what uh, you just mentioned this uh, story about this man whose father uh, made the cross, the Chinese yes. cross. But yeah. what what other kinds of reactions have you had, either from survivors of the war and or their families? What what are people telling you about these books and and the efforts you've made to? Uh, to memorialize not only your father, but the many uh, tens of thousands who suffered in Changi, in Changi prison. Well, I have to say I'm not the only one who's written a book. Um, quite sure. a few of us have. But um, there's it, everyone, it's like a family. The children of these Far East prisons of war, we all feel like a, a big family. We all know what the others have been through. Um, and so that everyone is just so pleased to have any information out there just to keep their story alive because it was such a dreadful time and they were heroes the people who survived were heroes um to get through it all and they when they came home to england no one was interested in them you know the war was over they didn't want to know yeah. about it so they just were told to get on with their lives and many of them found it really difficult um because mm -hmm. of the trauma they'd been through well we have some wonderful reactions coming through. Rob says, uh, will Louise ever be returning to Singapore at any time for any live event? I will attend and bring 20 more with me to hear her personal accounts and renditions of her father's journals uh, and her book. So, I mean, are you coming back to Singapore? That's the first I, I part of the question. And the second to, part yes. is, I would like to know, did your father ever come back? Yeah. And if he did or didn't, what were his views or memories of Singapore? Oh, I, I feel so sad because he wanted to bring my mother out to Singapore um, and to Thailand, but he died at um, the age of 65 before he retired, so they couldn't come. Um, mm. His memories, he, he, he especially thought Thailand was very beautiful. Um, uh, I, and as I said, I'm afraid I don't know his memories because he never, he never talked about them, apart from mm. saying um, that it was the most wonderful time of my life, despite the grim, the, uh, the, the grim years you know, the starvation and everything, because he was for once, he said you saw people as they really were, um, you know, they were down to bedrock, and um, they were very real, and he said people did have a faith and they wanted to practice their faith. Uh, he wasn't He wasn't the man who, you know, was proselytizing, he, he was very quiet about his faith, but I think he inspired a lot of people to have hope that, you know, um, if they didn't die, then, you know, maybe life in the future would be okay. And he did try to keep their spirits up um, yeah. because it was so important. Because as you probably know, some people just simply turned their faces to the wall and died. I have, I've heard that from a lot yeah. of prisoners. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, uh, of course, the uh, the famous uh, Elie Wiesel book, Man's Search for Meaning, about That's the prisoners it. in yeah. in uh, the concentration camps yeah. and that the hum yeah. how the human spirit was so yeah. important. Yeah. And I would imagine people like your father were helping to keep that human That's spirit it. alive Absolutely. and looking forward. Uh, Louise, what do you feel at this point in your life and the, and the writing and the research you've done, what do you feel like? the stories are that are still left to be told or uncovered what's what would be next for either yourself or the next generation of historians well um in fact i i've i spent a lot of time um, interviewing people my generation that's the second generation um about their um the effect that the trauma has had on them because several people of my generation have actually had breakdowns <clears throat> 
um, they, they are still traumatized by their father's trauma. A, a lot of what happened was the men came home and they would have, even though they were quiet during the day, they were to t terrible nightmares. I heard yeah. some several, they'd be running, running up and down screaming. And of course, that mm. was fearfully upsetting for their children, uh, my mm -hmm. generation. So I, I've interviewed uh, over 30 people about it. And I think um, I want that to be put out there, that generation is not, trauma is not necessarily one generation. It can go down mm -hmm. to the next generation and even yeah. to the generation after that. There have been a lot of studies of Holocaust, the Holocaust, mm -hmm. of course, but fewer yeah. about the Far East prisons of war. Such such a uh, yeah such an extraordinary such a point it yeah. really is and you know Louise uh, before we wrap up I did want to really thank you for coming on today and sharing these stories we will share this podcast we will put all the links up to your book but I wanted to finish on something which I find really truly uplifting I'm going to hold up this book Eric and Scrunch Ball also available at Changi Chapel and at bookstores across Singapore based on a true story tell us this wonderful <laughs> uplifting story well um. When my father went off to war, he was only 30, and he left behind a wife and two little boys and a Scotty dog. And Scotty dogs, is, do you know what I mean by Scotty dog, those little black dogs? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, they're known to be one-man dogs, and he was obviously devoted to my dad. Well, my mother said that after my father left, and he left, as you know, for three and a half years, mm. this dog, if nothing else, was good, he'd just go up to the garden gate and wait for him. Uh -oh. Day after day, he would mm -hmm. go there when there was mm -hmm. nothing else going on. And it's quite amusing because when my father did come back, he recognised him, but he still went to the gate for a couple of days and then thought, oh, no, I don't have to wait anymore. <laughs> and so um, my son, actually, um, I've got a grandson now, a little, a little one, and my son said, we're going to have to write that story down for my grandson. And it's a good way to introduce the story of war to younger children because it doesn't mention the horrors. It just mentions that there was a war. So um, we're very pleased yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful That's... story. All three books, I will share the links later. Louis Cordenley, author of The Changi Cross, Down to Bedrock, and Eric and Scrunch Ball. Thank you for sharing your stories and your memories of the wonderful sacrifice that your father and tens of thousands of others paid during this time 80 years ago. Louis, thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank, thank you, you Louise. so much. I'm very appreciated. Wonderful to have you. Yeah. Okay.